Welcome everyone. I so miss seeing you. Uh, it's been so great uh, over the last couple of weeks to pop into home churches, getting to see people at midday prayer and the parents check in. It was especially awesome to see so many of you at Central Night uh, and the week before at East Side Night. Uh, I've been able to pop into the North uh, Zoom service. Uh, it's just been, it's been great to see you all in those places, but none of that fills the hug-sized hole in my heart. Um, I hope you're well. Uh, and as always, please, please reach out to us if you have uh, any needs at all, if you need anything, if you need to chat. Um, a big thanks, before I jump into the talk, I wanted to give a big thanks to everyone who helped coordinate uh, and drop off meals this week to frontline workers and all the others who are pouring themselves out in this season. Um, we are continuing our series called A New Normal. And basically what we're doing is reminding each other of, uh, of the fact that when things go back to some semblance of normal, um, you don't have to. We're asking the question, are we becoming more or are we becoming less in this season, in this uh, Kairos moment, if you tuned in last Sunday. And today I wanna talk about self-discovery. I wanna speak to the idea of examining your soul. So if you would join me in prayer as we kind of prepare our hearts to hear the text. Lord, as we take a moment of stillness and silence, we um, kind of tune into our breath. And I pray that we're just reminded that every breath is a gift. Every breath is grace. We know there's something powerful, Lord, when your people, even when they're disconnected like this, when we open the scriptures together and we rally around learning about the person of Jesus, Lord, there's something beautiful and mysterious uh, healing, encouraging, convicting that happens, Lord. So we pray, open our eyes that we would see you, our ears, Lord, that we would hear you, our hearts, Lord, that we would encounter and know you more. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. So I wanna talk about self-discovery and talk about this idea of examining your soul. On the journey of faith, it is so important that you take time to take account for who you are and where you are, examining who you are from the inside out. Self-discovery leads us into self-awareness. Uh, I don't know if you ever met somebody who seriously lacks self-awareness. I have uh, flown a lot this past year for one reason or another, and I've been amazed at how many people do not understand the international sign for, I am not available. I have my headphones on, uh, and still I will be the person who finds themselves next to the person that just wants to chat. And because I'm a pastor, I feel like I should connect, and I do, but usually I just wanna work and I wanna sleep or I wanna play, pray that the, uh, the plane doesn't crash. Um, and so I'm usually not necessarily sitting next to the rudest person on the plane, I'm just sitting next to the person that lacks any kind of self-awareness. Uh, it's the same kind of person who feels compelled to ask a woman if she's pregnant. Like, don't, don't ever do that. Like, can I get an amen from the mothers out there on Mother's Day? Like, men, unless a woman freely offers that info up to you, don't ask. I don't care how sure you are that she's pregnant. <laughs> all, all of us know self-awareness matters because if we can miss it socially, if we can be socially so unaware, uh, we can miss it spiritually. There are a lot of people who would say, uh, I'm a follower of Jesus. And, and yet when you get down to it, they don't really live that way at all. It's one thing to say I'm saved by grace or I have a new identity in Jesus or I have new life in Jesus, but you just keep defaulting to your old identity. We need to be a people that stop and take time to examine what's coming out of us because that will tell us who we really are right now. Not your projected self, your actual self, the culture of your heart now, not the vision of who you want to become. If you're like me, you're constantly living in the future. Like what's coming, what will be fixed, what will be even better? And we need to come to terms with our actual self. When you're dating someone, you're dating their projected self. And when you get married, you will meet their actual self. Um, 
when you, you, you go on those dates when you're dating and everybody is like in the perfect outfit and hair is did just right. And when you get married, you, you get slippers and you get like very old crusted PJs. Not that I know anything about that. Um, <laughs> examining yourself comes up again and again in the scriptures. Like thinking about like how do we how do we become more aware of what's happening in our own hearts comes up again and again in letters and laments and prayers. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul writes to this church in Corinth. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. He's saying, like, test yourselves to make sure you aren't deceiving yourself, saying one thing and living another. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. Galatians talks about fruit. Like if you're a healthy vine or a tree or a pick your plant of choice, you should see some fruit. The fruit of the spirit, it says, is love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. These are the things that should be coming out of you. In that same letter uh, in Galatians 6, 3 to 5, Paul writes, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. This verse is like for like every time I stepped onto a soccer field or a basketball court or a jazz band in high school, like I deceive myself. Examining, testing, this is about confronting your actual self. Why? Because if you never discover who you are now, you'll never... Um, you'll never realize or begin to know who you were meant to be. The starting point is discovering where you are. I don't know if you've ever gotten lost in the mall or get confused on where you parked your car, like what do you do? You go to the big kiosk, you go to the big map, and then before you look for the place you're going to, you look for the big star that says you are here. Because my starting point of the journey is where I actually am. So today we would just want to confront who we really are. And I'm excited for this today because I think this is a perfect time for this confrontation of the self. Because we are all in one way or another being squeezed right now. We are two months into this corona moment. <laughs> and when all this has happened, when all of this squeezing and pressure comes in general in life, when obstacles and challenges and pressure comes, we start to show what's really inside. I think we've got enough time under our belt of being in isolation of starting to like be able to stop and pause and go, what is coming out in the midst of all of this pressure? A moment like this asks us the question, what are you full of? Like what's actually inside of you? What's good and what's broken? In, uh, in Lamentations 3, uh, the writer is being squeezed. Like everything is going wrong. The whole book is lament. God, where are you? How could you? He's sorting out his feelings and he's sorting out his thoughts on God in the midst of pressure, in the midst of obstacles. He writes things like this. I am the man who has seen affliction. I've been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. He says, I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. But then he changes it up. He says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And then in verse 40, he says, so let us examine our ways and test them. Let us return to the Lord. Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. As he's being squeezed, he recalls God's faithfulness and this seems to cause him to examine what's happening in his soul. As we look around our world, as our world is getting squeezed, not everything that's coming out of it is good. There is good, don't get me wrong. There's great art and unity and compassion and generosity, but we're seeing all sorts of brokenness and racism and fear and evil and misinformation. In your heart today, I just wanna ask like, what's coming out of you as you're being squeezed in this moment with the pressure up, 
with being cooped up at home, with loneliness maybe setting in, what is coming out that you didn't know was in there? Pressure. Pressure has a way of helping us examine who we really are. In the book of Proverbs, it describes the soul as having deep waters. Like you are complex. In the depth of your being, you are complex. And a pandemic can actually be a helpful tool to help you go swimming around in there. Like, what are you stressed about? What are you worried about? What are you anxious for? What are you burdened by? What did you bring to this screen today? So I wanna do something different. I wanna hand you a few questions that I believe are gonna help you examine yourself. Because if we wanna be fully alive, if we want the desires of our heart to align with perfect love and perfect peace, with truth, if we want to become more, then we have to move beyond talking about the importance of becoming aware of who we are and where we are at. We have to actually do it. So the pastor theologian uh, A.W. Tozer gives us seven things to contemplate when it comes to examining your soul. And he calls them rules for self-discovery. And he's got seven of them. So what I'd like to encourage you to do is grab a pen, paper, notes from your, you know, notes section from your phone. And I wanna quickly walk through these seven rules. And I wanna give you some time before I close to wrestle with them for a second, to kind of get started. So the first rule, for self-discovery for A.W. Tozer is um, the first question to help us examine our heart is what do we want? We have real desires and and then we have our, our truest desires and closing the gap is critical in becoming a rooted, grounded person in Christ. If you're like me, you have the things that you want on the surface and then the things you really want, your deepest wants. And those things just conflict far too often. See, our hearts are oriented primarily by desire, by what we love. The Christian understanding of desire is much more sophisticated than the sort of follow your heart view that dominates so much of our culture. We believe it's actually like a war of desires, of a war of loves. You have spirit and you have flesh and the flesh is what a neurobiologist would call the animal brain. Like our animal brain is the place of domination, of survival, of sexual pleasure, things like that. It's like primal. And right now it's easier than ever to be distracted by our animal brain uh, in their digital age because you have marketing departments all over the world who have figured out how to manipulate the vulnerabilities in human psychology, monetize this part of our animal brain that's wired for comparison and competition and a deep urge that we all feel to look and feel good. All of that just to get us to buy a product. They play on our base desires all the while. There are deeper ones, our truest ones in Jesus that are just far better. And the Bible makes it clear that the real and the true have a very troubled relationship. At the end of the day, you are what you love, James K. Smith says. For instance, it's normal to want success and on the surface, striving for achievement may seem to be enough, but we have to dig deep to find the motivation behind a want like that because there are God motivations and there are dark ones. Like it says in Psalm 37, God wants to give us the desires of our heart. There's like a promise that God will give us the desires of our heart, the deepest and truest God desires. So answering the question, what you want the most will tell you what you value the most. Number two, what we do with our leisure time. So you spend roughly 56 hours sleeping, 56 hours working or commuting or thinking about work, that should be a little less, but let's just round that out, which leaves about 56 hours left of free time. Examining what you spend your time on, Tozer argues, um, will determine who we are. For the follower of Jesus, free time isn't cheap. We're encouraged to infuse our leisure time with value. Paul says, make the most of your time. I think if you're taking notes, there are three filters that can help guide our use of our free time. Uh, And they're rest, improvement, and passion. When we rest, it shows that we trust God's in control. When we care about our mind, our bodies, and our soul, uh, when we sow truth into them, we become good stewards of what God's given us. And when we put our energy towards the thing we would do, even if we didn't get paid for it, that's where we find passion. 
We must learn to leverage our time because as life progresses, our time decreases. Maximizing our spare time and creating value around it will prevent us from wasting it. So answering the question, what am I doing with my free time, will reveal your level of intentionality. It will, as it says in Hebrews, keep you from drifting. Three, is the company we enjoy. So this is just about examining who you're around, who's in your circle of friends, who are you seeing? Are you surrounded by people who will lift you up or drag you down? The company you keep is a reflective mirror on both who you are now and who you're gonna be. I have a friend who always says, show me your four closest friends and I will show you who you're becoming. I think he's right. Relationships play a major part in examining your soul and the direction of your life. Think of like oxen in a field. And depending on who you are yoked to can make a big difference between going in a straight line or going around in circles. There's this uh, story in the gospels of a paralyzed man whose friends do whatever it takes to get Jesus uh, to be healed. And they can't get through this massive crowd. They're trying to get their paralytic friend to Jesus. Massive crowd in front of this house. Can't get through. So they climb on the roof, cut a hole in it, and lower their friend down. The paralyzed man has, I think, some like really good friends here. Like they lower him down and he's healed. Um, his friendship, the people that he was surrounded with, like that leads to his healing and forgiveness of sin and soul restoration. It's a crazy story. Sometimes it takes the faithfulness of others to lead us to our fullest potential. And that's the ultimate marker of the best relationship that any of us can have. So answering the question, like who's in your circle, that, that'll help show you who you're becoming. I don't know what number we're on now, four? Four. How you use your money. <laughs> uh, you can usually tell what people value by looking at their schedule, but also looking at their bank statement. Many times we choose not to practice generosity until we have like a certain amount of money. We withhold our finances from God or from others, trusting in our ability to do more with it. And if you're a follower of Jesus, we have to remember it's about getting our heart right first, not attaining more money. Where our money is spent shows what we're interested in and where our heart's invested. I think an important principle is God never intended for us to hold on to what he originally gave us. In the scriptures, um, people are blessed to be a blessing. No one's just blessed for blessing's sake. It's always to bless others. And a moment like this can help us examine where our security comes from, where our fear is and who we trust. And what we really believe about Jesus's words that it's better to give than to receive. So answering the question, how are you using your money right now is gonna tell you where your treasure really is. Five, what we think about most. So like a train, our thoughts kind of lead us to a destination, either positive or negative. And the beauty is we often have a choice on which train we decide to get on. The scripture says, do not let your hearts be troubled. The scriptures say, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. I love these verses because they remind me that I have some agency over my thought life. If our train of thought is in line with God's word, or if it's foolish and unwise, we should like let it pass. If it's not in line with what God wants, we need to let it pass. Are you gravitating toward anxiety and doubt? Or are you clinging to hope and faith and joy? Philippians 4.8 says, uh, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, write these down, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Answering the question, what am I thinking about the most? will tell you a lot about how you're feeling and where your head is really at. A.W. Tozer's next principle is what we laugh at. Like, what are you laughing at? I love this. Like, what is filling you with joy? What's bringing you true joy? God wants us to find our joy, um, not just through like good times, but have it being rooted in Him trusting in his faithfulness. To find true joy, we have to understand God is our source of joy. 
choosing to stay connected to him and not just around the things that reflect him. Knowing God um, is our satisfaction, is our satisfaction means intentionally seeking a place and time to connect with him, to rest in his promises, to feast and enjoy God's good creation. Joy, even in mourning, is possible with God, as we sang earlier today. Joy is not situational. Joy is actually kind of supernatural. You'll find that as you continue to seek him. He'll manifest that true joy in your life by turning uh, your circumstances and circumstances like this into deep contentment. So answering the question, like, what are we laughing at? Will help us know what's bringing us true joy. What's really getting us through the day with a smile on our face. And last one, who and what we admire. If you're still taking notes, three areas to observe that can help us determine the aim of our admiration. Who we look at, what we study, and how we behave. I think these are all indicators of what we're focused on. So zeroing in on what we hold in high esteem can show us what direction we're headed in and who we'll become. Doing the things that have um, have our attention that we admire lead us back to Jesus. My friend John Tyson says, attention leads to admiration. What we keep our attention on will actually lead us to a place of admiration where distraction leads us to despair. Are our eyes fixed on Jesus? So answering the question, who and what do you admire will help us know what has our attention. So let's just take a few minutes and reflect on these seven things. Let's take seriously this call to examine our hearts, to examine our souls, to ask, all right, as we're being squeezed right now, what's coming out of us? 